Hey there, Fake Fam. Today I've got a new series I want to share with you. Something different and exciting and important. So you know what? Keep it locked right here. Shawty speaks now. It's Shani on Shani Speaks Now. What's good, beautiful people? It's your girl Shani here, your little big sis, because while I may be small in stature, I try to always be, always be big on the sisterly love. Now, today I'm actually bearing off course a little bit with Always Keep the Faith Fridays and bring you something different and new this Friday as I want to introduce you to a very important purpose, passion series that is on my heart that I felt led to start doing this year in 2023. I shared in my first episode of this year that there's some new things coming to the horizon and this is one of those new things. And it is a new series that I'm calling My Fill in the Blank Story. What does that mean, Shani? I'm gonna go ahead and tell you. Well, as far as the fill in the blank, those blanks are gonna be filled in with different things that have to do with women's wellness, their reproductive health, their pregnancy journey, and other ailments that have to do with their reproductive system. For those of you who've been watching me for a while, you know that I shared very candidly last year my experience with fibroids, endometriosis, and even my miscarriage. And my transparency, not just here on YouTube, but also on social media, has allowed other women to feel comfortable sharing their stories as well. I've received lots of DMs, text messages, emails of women just sharing like, I didn't know that this is something that you dealt with, or I dealt with this too, or I have a family member that's dealt with this. And that really led me to decide, you know what, God, I want to use my story to, of course, encourage others, but why can't I amplify the voices of other women? So yes, that is what this series is all about. I did an Instagram live and I did my very first My Fibroid Story with my very dear, beautiful sister, Marika Stewart, who shares her fibroid story. Now, with her being my sister, let me tell you, this interview, this chat was everything because we were so real and so candid and we could bounce off each other so easily because we know a lot of each other's stories. But her story is not the only one that I plan to share. I'll be doing an Instagram live. At this point, it's gonna be monthly, but with the way that I have things coming in, it may be twice a month. I don't know but every time that I do one I want to share it right here with you all on YouTube as well so that you have more access to it you can share it with more people and hopefully more eyes can see it so more people can see and feel a sense of community around the issues that they deal with there's so many women that are dealing with things not just with fibroids endometriosis or even miscarriage but postpartum depression cancers we're gonna get into all of that so this very first interview is between me and my sister and I won't belabor it because obviously in the interview I share a lot Lot more about why I even am doing this series in the first place but this is one of many to come so go ahead and watch this and I'll see you all after the interview is over um, but we really just wanted to uh, get on here and um, just really start creating more community um, I've shared a little bit more on my story as of really 2021 or early 2022 and God has just laid it on my heart to do that on a more regular basis, on a more consistent basis. I learned that when I shared about my fibroids journey and my journey with endometriosis and my journey with miscarriage and all those different things that a lot of women, um, especially came out the woodworks and were saying, look, that's my story too. I've had that experience. I know exactly what you're talking about. And one that made me feel seen, but I realized that was making other people feel seen. And, um, I just realized that was something really important. So this year, you know, God was like, look, I need you to do more of that. Um, I wanted to do more of it last year, but last year was a little bit trickier. And I'll share a little bit more of an update um, on that in a little bit. But that's really the purpose of this, to amplify voices of those that have been affected by different inf infertility or fertility issues or different mm -hmm. issues concerning their menstrual cycles from fibroids to hysterectomies to cancer to endometriosis, um, miscarriage. There's so many different things. And again, many of those things are seen as taboo topics that a lot of people either don't want to talk about or, you know, are scared to talk about or it's unusual to talk about or sometimes have shame to talk about. Um, so that is what this is about. And I'm excited that Marika has decided to join, even though we have a lot of these conversations one-on-one um, on, one on a regular basis. This is, this is a homie. This is the bestie. Um, but 
I'm glad that she is at a point where she wanted to be able to share more of this um, on a more open basis. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, <laughs> so first and foremost, welcome guys. Thanks again for being here. Um, I am Shani Jones, and I will introduce us because even though I know for you all on Instagram, many of you that are coming on the live, y'all already know us, you all are peoples, but because we'll re rebroadcast this on Instagram and also add it to YouTube, I kind of wanted to give a little bit of context so people would be like, who are these people? What are they talking about? But my name is Shani Jones. Outside of being a real estate agent, I, um, I love television. I am a host, speaker, um, have become in the last couple of years a content creator. And um, really just feel like now I also want to have a platform for women who are dealing with different issues when it comes to their fertility or infertility or anything that just concerns their cycles and, and womanhood. So that is what this is all about. <laughs> and I have my sister Marika on here. She is coming yeah. out from Las Vegas. <laughs> Um, so I'm so glad that she's on here and she's going to be sharing her story. Hey, family, I see all these messages. Um, and if we do have time towards the end, if there's anything that we discuss that you want to ask more questions about, we will uh, allow for questions. So I'll probably just see any questions that they pop up and try to read them and catch on to them. But without further ado, I want to start off with a recapping where I am in my journey. Um, I shared last year that December of 2021 that I, after me and my husband were trying for a while to try to have children and kind of wondering what was going on, that um, I went to a reproductive specialist only to find out that I had fibroids and I had one that was super large, um, about the size of like a large orange or a small grapefruit, depending on how you want to look at it, and two other fibroids. And those were preventing me from being able to get pregnant. I had a myomectomy, which essentially is a C-section, and also a laparoscopy, which is a robotic surgery to remove those in December. I spent the first half of 2022 recovering um, for about two months, roughly, and then not too long after that, I discovered that I was pregnant. I was super excited about, about that. Praise God, hallelujah. However, towards the end of April, right before I got to my two months of pregnancy, I, I realized that there was issues with our baby and we had a miscarriage. So that was a very, very difficult part of the journey. Um, and, you know, thankfully, after a while of being able to heal a little bit, um, we were trying again, only to discover in September of last year of 2022, that once again, I had a fibroid that it looks like it may have been there in the beginning, but was not discovered at the time that I had my other surgeries. And I had to have surgery again, December 8th of 2022. So literally about, what, three months ago at this point, December to January, January, February, two months or so at this point, um, which, you know, was not something that I was anticipating or expecting. Again, thankful that it was found. Um, but that's kind of, you know, how this journey has been. So fibroids is something that has definitely been somewhat of a detriment to me. However, before any of that took place, my sister actually had surgery in um, what the summer of 2020. And that was before or any of my story unfolded. And at the time she was not as vocal because I think mm -hmm. for all of us, it was just new. We didn't know what to think or you know what to even consider at that time. Um, but you know, now she is open and ready and willing to share her story. So we'll get into that a little bit, but first I just wanted to introduce Marika and have her introduce <laughs> herself. Now, me and Marika are sisters. She is five years younger than me, even though we call ourselves a five years twin because we are so close. She is so talented. Um, outside of being an HR director, she is a dancer, she's a choreographer, she is a music artist, um, she is creative, she is beautiful, <laughs> she is the bomb, um, but she's just all around great people. So Meeks, if there's anything that I have not said that you wanna share with the people, tell me Thank a little you, bit Thank you, Shani. It's so nice to be on. I feel like I have been away from the masses for a while. And excuse me, I am a little under the weather. So yeah, if yeah. I, uh, <laughs> yes, she is. So that's another thing, people. She's under the weather. We planned this, and then yeah. we did not plan this like this. But she's she's bringing it together for us. So I'm glad that she's yes. willing and able. To yeah. Be so able to outside of that, um, you know, child of God, I got to put that out there because that's just who I am. Um, 
and a, a wife. Uh, you know, that's a newer role for me as of two and a half years now. Um, and like you said, you know, professional from an HR standpoint, been with Vax Care, which is a healthcare technology company, uh, for 10 plus years. So I know a lot of people don't even know that about me. People think that I dance full time, which is great. I wish mean, that was the case, but <laughs> I spend the majority of my time as an HR director right. and really just uh, getting settled here in Vegas. As you know, I was in Orlando for years, many, many years. Yeah. And um, <laughs> and moved out here with my hubby, but um, it's been a, a fun transition. So I just want to thank you for having me on, Shani, as one of your first guests to kick off this new segment. I'm honored. <laughs> Girl, I thank you that you are one of the first people. And I know that this is going to be a little bit of a probably <laughs> uh, unorthodox <laughs> conversation because, again, we're mm-hmm. sisters. We know a lot of each other's stories. So it'll, it'll be low-key a interview slash chat slash going back and forth so hopefully you all are down for that um probably one of the most candid ones of these but like she mentioned this is a series i'm going to be doing this once a month Mm -hmm. it is going to be called Mm -hmm. my blank story and i will insert the place with different things so this one is my fibroid um my fibroid and fertility but really my fibroid story i will have one at the end of next month march 26th Um, I will get more into that details later. That will be the next story. Um, So I'm looking forward to doing that and having Meeks on here. So one of the things that people may not know, and I especially wanted to discuss this um, to all of our women out there who may have daughters, me and my sister, which is kind of where this story starts, Mm -hmm. both got our cycles at nine years old. Um, Now, if you think about a nine-year-old, they haven't hit double digits yet. Um, I was in fourth grade. Yeah, fourth grade. Probably mm-hmm. fourth grade as well. So, so that's the first thing is a lot of times people think that um, talking about menstrual cycles, talking about, you know, sex even, that it's something to save for when a child is a teenager or for when they get older, but um, it's not. And we are very blessed because we have a mother who she was a social worker. She also was a teen parent teacher. So she taught taught young girls who got pregnant in high school how to take care of their babies, all those things. So needless to say, the things that she was teaching them, she was also teaching us. And um, she was able to find very um, age appropriate ways to share that about us. So, or share those things with us, I should say. So I know for me, even though at nine, it was very, very, um, it was very (laughs) scary. crazy yeah. to, to know that that was happening to me. I knew what it was. And, you know, I was able to kind of, you know, my mom was able to be like, you know what to do. So that was both of our um, experience. What was it like for you when you, you know, finally got your I was I was a little in shock because mom told us, right? She told us it was going to happen. Mm-hmm. I think being a child, being I was <laughs> in recorder class or something crazy and this happening, I was like, I remember something about this. And then knowing this was a new responsibility, right? So coming home and mom's like, what you're going to have to do to take care of yourself. And I'm like, this is going to come every month, once a month for how many days? So I think just, yes. you know, parents out there, please prepare your kids as much as possible. It's it's an uncomfortable topic, but they will feel so much better if something happens to them in school or when they're not with you so that they know at least what it is. Yeah. So mom did a good job. Correct. No, I agree. I remember I hated it because I was an athlete from a very young age. At that time, I was running track and I think I was also playing volleyball. And I remember for me, when I turned nine, Mm -hmm. my cycles have always been terrible. I've had the worst menstrual cycles probably all of my life um, up until Mm -hmm. maybe, you know, in my 30s, really. And um, so I got sick. I would vomit, I'd have to miss days of school. And I remember having to miss like a very important track meet because of it. And just, I remember being very angry and frustrated. Like, why is this happening? Why do I have this? Do I, can't it go away until the track meet is done? Not really understanding that part of it. And I see a couple people, I see one of our cousins, Sayava in here. Mm-hmm. Um, she, her daughter's turning nine soon if she's not ready. I mean, listen, it's, <laughs> and one of our friends <laughs> said she still doesn't like it. Listen. I don't think menstrual cycles are ever anything that anyone right. likes, but that is how God did it. At least as adults, we can understand it a little bit better. But as children, it's a lot harder to understand. But I know for me, right. I got sick very often. Like I was always having to sometimes, if not miss school, I would have to leave school. I vomited a lot. My pain was excruciating for a long time. 
but your yeah so when I first you. started um it was annoying I would have cramps here or there but nothing definitely as bad as yours for sure I would say maybe up until yeah. about college um you know after after high school college is when it got worse for me and then worse um in my mid-20s into my 30s which I thought was odd but uh, it didn't get yeah. worse for me but I understood yeah. a little bit more of why and we're going to go into that you know today for sure yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. let's go ahead and dig into that now that we have gotten to the beginning of kind of where this womanhood journey starts. And even the, th the thought mm -hmm. of saying at nine that your womanhood journey starts, that's why it's so, 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 so very important to talk to your kids. Like parents, if you can't right. do it, find somebody that you trust to be able to do it for you. But please don't wait until your kids are teenagers. It, it's too mm -hmm. late. Like they need to know very early. Um, and that way also, I, the one thing I'm thankful for is our mothers who we went to with those questions because we trusted her because she told us what we need to know at an early age. So we knew that we could go to her and get sound advice. I'm sure it probably wasn't um, easy for her, but it was the yeah. truth. And I see one of our younger cousins saying that her story is similar um, with, with her and us. So, I mean, again, we're not the only one because a lot of times people think this is happening at 12, 13, mm -hmm. obviously things happen in, at even younger ages. So let's talk about your shift. You noticed that things were shifting for you in your twenties. Right. So what was, what I, was I noticed that my cramps were intensifying so much more. Um, my cycles were longer and they were heavier and just way more uncomfortable. And the pain that I felt was just a little different. You know, you have the cramps, but it, it just felt a little bit more. And so that's what I was like, I talked to you, I talked to mom about it. Um, and I was like, I think I need to go get checked. And, you know, I would do my annual. But when I went in uh, September of 2019 was the first time I heard anything about a fibroid. And at that time when I went, um, my doctor at the time, I wouldn't say she played it down, but she definitely didn't make it seem like it was anything serious. She's like, oh, you know, it's just a few tiny fibroids, probably nothing serious. Um, I would go ahead and get birth control to help with the pain. Um, and maybe that can lessen your, you know, your heavy flow. She would say, you know, maybe lose some weight that can help. I was like, all right, girl, I hear you. You know, so they would just tell you all these things. And then um, I think, you know, I went through that experience in September, but it still wasn't getting better. And so uh, come January, February, March of 2020, I was still having pretty bad cycles in my mom at the time and us were binging on Greenleaf. Yes, shame on us, we're binging. <laughs> now, hold on. Before we get that, that because you're <laughs> super speeding through the story. Before we get that far, was there anything that you did prior to 2019 when you started feeling that things were changing and that, that you were sick? Did you talk to doctors even before yeah, that? Yeah, so did I did. You, you know, that? I went back. So after my original appointment, um, I did ask to get an ultrasound at the time. So they did check it out and say that, yes, I did have five words, but it was nothing to worry about. So it was, so that and was that, later that was in uh, 2019. So September. Okay. So prior nothing. to 2019, there wasn't no. anything that you did, even though you were experiencing pain. Okay. And the reason why I bring that up is because I know for me, I had pain and I actually right. tried from a very young age. I was checked for cysts. I was checked for endometriosis. I was checked for fibroids. And right. they kept on telling me they did not find anything. So finally, I like you, they told me to do birth control to try to take care of the pain. I wasn't mm -hmm. very uh, keen on the idea because a lot of times, you know, they're concerned that birth control can have young girls' bodies blow up. And it's, you know, something they don't need in their system, you know, at such a young age. Um, also, uh, you know, our stories, we were right. until marriage. So there was also a stigma of just like, if I'm not doing anything to need birth right. control, should I even be on birth control? So there was that, that aspect of <laughs> my mom I'm really not. very happy about either. But it did help regulate some of the pain for me in college because in college, the pain was excruciating. And now you're not just missing like class daily. Like you could be missing mm. semesters worth, you know, weeks worth of schooling. If you have a class that you're only taking two days a week and you're missing one week, you know, one day out of that week. But I know for me, it got to a point where I was going to doctors and asking them, they were telling me nothing was wrong. And I started to believe that. So I thought I was just one right. of those people who was just always going to have pain. And I mm -hmm. stopped asking to do an ultrasound. I stopped asking to do anything because they told me. Um, so I wasn't sure if 
there was anything. No, prior to that, I mean, you know my story. You know my story with doctors. I've never been a huge fan. Uh, just yeah. with what happened with my my tumors back in the day in 2009 and just the care that I received. I think a lot of, you know, the care that I received hasn't, hasn't been the best until mom advocated for me. Until I pushed or until I'm like yeah. at death's door and they're like, yeah. oh, something is wrong with you. So I think that was the biggest part about it is when I heard it, I just kind of down, downplayed it myself. Um, but when I realized mm-hmm. that physically, mm-hmm. like it just something was not right is when I decided to get a second opinion yeah. for sure. Yeah, no, I feel <laughs> you, I feel you. Okay, yes. so we're going to fast forward back to you going to the doctors in 2019, you realizing that, you know, something definitely wasn't quite mm-hmm. right and telling you that it was fibroids. And then you were about to mention that you were watching yeah. Greenleaf. Yes. Ever so Greenleaf. Um, yes, so I actually, um, I was working out one day as I used to do very often. And um, <laughs> as we, as we I was getting it in. And um, all of a sudden, I had this sharp pain in my stomach, like someone stabbed me and it would not go away. I remember crawling up the stairs and laying on my floor for like two hours in my bedroom, like, I can't move. I was like paralyzed. And I was like, what is this? And a part of me was like, did a cyst rupture? Because I've heard about those things happening. I can believe this what that is. Right, but, you right. know, was able to get through it, get some pain meds, rest it off, for, you know, for the next day. Then I was OK. So I was like, don't know what it was. So then my mom, our mom, was watching Greenlee. She was like, have you gotten to the episode with the daughter? And I'm like, yeah. I haven't gotten to the episode with the mom. She's like, just watch it. And I'm like, OK. So finally, I get to the episode maybe a week or two later. And in the episode, the daughter was running, jogging, working out and had this excruciating pain, keeled over after the workout. And then, you know, if I come to find out, she ended up having to get her ovaries removed because something, you know, had caused her um, reproductive cycle to not be functioning or else she was going to have cancer. And it just became this big thing. And so she had her ovaries removed, right. therefore she could not, you know, have babies. And it just paralyzed me. I was like, right. what? This looked like in my experience, mm, yeah. but like in the acting form. So it was yeah. just very apparent that something was definitely wrong more than just what I thought. And so after that, I talked to mom and was like, I need a second opinion. And so my mom had, our mom had an yeah. OBG in St. Petersburg that she trusted. <laughs> and um, I made the trip and made an appointment to actually go see someone else. And when I went, that was probably around, I would say May. May of 2020, when I finally had the appointment and they did the ultrasound and she comes in the room after looking at my results and she's like, what is your summer looking like? And I'm just like, what an odd question. Oh. And she's like, she's like, you not need surgery like summer? yesterday. And I said, excuse me. And I didn't, I knew it was bad because my flow was really ugly and I was in a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. And she's like, so basically mm-hmm. you have three fibroids that are lining your uterus and the way that they're positioned Anytime you have a cycle, it's just a lot of pressure in that area. So that's why it's super heavy and that's why it's super painful. And she's like, how long have you been dealing with this? I was like, probably got worse last year, but for a while now. And so she said, we need to get you in here ASAP for surgery. And so I was freaking out. <laughs> yeah. So let's pause right there. So you had went yes. to a doctor who is the doctor that you normally see. Yes. Had to go to another city. And get a second opinion. The first doctor nothing. acted yeah. like it was low key nothing, just wanted to put you on birth control. And you go to this doctor, and in one visit, they're telling you, yes. okay, yeah. you need to have major surgery. And I see a lot of people yeah. talking about us having to advocate for ourselves, the advocacy piece of it. Unfortunately, and I, I mean, I'm not saying this is not something that mm-hmm. other people deal with, but I, I know for sure, and we have seen it in the news cycles, especially of late, that Black women specifically. There is this weird stigma that either people don't believe that black women experience pain at the same levels as other women of you know other races, or sometimes we're not believed when we say that we have certain pains, or if we aren't yeah. um, super aggressive <laughs> and you know demand that we be seen and demand that this treatment be done, that it's not taken seriously. And I think I was also a victim of that in my my state. I mean, the fact of how big my fibroids were. I probably had them for a lot longer, but again, I'm not this pushover person, you know, I'm big on, you know, being able to handle whatever pain comes yeah. my way. And I know that that's how <laughs> you are, and I know that's how our mom is too. 
but I just want to point out the fact that please, anyone watching this and listening, like if you are not sure if you're having certain pains, if there's certain things going on, like my sister did, which I did not do, if I'm being honest, like I, I didn't have the same, even though right. there were some doctors, I've switched doctors, but I finally found a doctor that I trusted. So I wasn't as, when I was told like, that's, you know, that's probably it. I didn't take the time mm -hmm. to get a second opinion um, until I got a referral from the doctor mm -hmm. I trusted to see somebody else on a deeper level. Um, but I'm glad that you had the foresight to be like, yeah, I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not feeling what this person is saying. Yeah, so I think I need to push it something just to definitely different. didn't feel right. And then it's like your body knows. <laughs> it's, it's very odd. But when I was coming up mm -hmm. into the time closer to my surgery, my cycle went crazy on me like two months ago. Right. Oh, Z. And so I was like, all right, God, it's time. Like, it has to be time. This is a sign. You're telling me that, you know, it's long overdue. And so make the, make the appointment and get it yeah. done. I <laughs> promise <laughs> the same thing happened when it was closer to my surgery. My cycles the last two months prior. Right. Were, you trying to get rid of us? You about to act up. <laughs> it was terrible. So, okay. So okay. now we're at the point where they're telling you that you uh, are going to have to have surgery. And what do they explain to you in terms of what type of surgery you have to have? Right. So have, have to have um, they told me it was going to be a myomectomy. Uh, they said there were two ways that they could do it. They could, you know, basically do the bikini cut or if they could go in vaginally. I decided to go with the bikini cut. And so, you know, that was to me and for them, actually, they kind of suggested that because of the location of where they were. And mm -hmm. so uh, made the appointment. Mm -hmm. If anyone remembers 2020. There was a pandemic during that time. <laughs> so I had to reschedule maybe once or twice. And then like the day before my surgery, they tried to reschedule just because it was crazy. But I told them I was going to do it. I was already committed. And so because I decided to do it yeah. uh, July 9th of 2020, um, that meant that I would have to have an outpatient surgery, which was not fun and so decided to go in and have my surgery maybe around 11 o'clock that morning it had to be out of the hospital by 6 o'clock p.m because if not they were going to send me upstairs to the ward with folks who had COVID and I wasn't about that life so it was a very um, traumatic experience because I was in so much pain and so they gave me medication you remember my ball and chain I had for about five, six months. I do. Oh, yeah. It was medicine crazy. Ball. And uh, literally between the prayers, um, that's what kept me. I remember mom went with me and I just remember everyone praying over me and me praying for myself in the hospital bed that day. So much pain. Mm -hmm. um, but I was thankful that I did it. You know, when they finished the surgery, it was a success. They did mention at the time that my left fallopian tube was damaged during surgery. So I was a little nervous mm. because, you know, I was freaking out beforehand because they said with any of these surgeries, you never know if you can get pregnant or not. And so that was always yeah. a concern in the back of my mind that I never really vocalized a lot. Yeah. And so after I heard that there was some damage during the surgery, I was just faithful. I was like, all right, God, well, we did it. We went through it and we'll just see what happens from there. And the damage happened during right. the surgery, so it wasn't something For sure. you had damage prior to. <clears throat> yeah, that's and that's the risk that even in sometimes in you trying to take care of right. or trying to get rid of something, that something else can happen that you don't know. And even let's just go yeah. back to the fact that you had to have a myomectomy, which is a whole C-section, and then had to go home later that <laughs> night. Yeah. And I mean, I remember because I drove down the day of your surgery. I couldn't be there. Right. You know, it was a pandemic, so they only allowed one person. So mom was with you. But I came down and I was there that night. In retrospect, because I too had to have a myomectomy, you know, roughly almost a, well, a little, little over a year later. Girl. I can't imagine like having to, I was in the yeah. hospital for two, two days, I think it was. Yeah, two days after my surgery. I could not imagine having to have that surgery and go home. And, and mind you, in the hospital, like, you know, I yeah. took yeah. it like a G as best as I could. Um, they <laughs> give you that good morphine button that you could just kind of, yeah. which was kind of the medicine ball that you had. But just the physical aspect of thinking about having to get in somebody's car, yep. be driven back home, to be taken into, you know, your room, 
and having to, you know, recover, even though, you know, there's yeah, nothing in the recovering, comfort. Again, you know, with family, right. and, you know, not having doctors to come in and out, but just the, the pain in that moment, like that surgery and the pain after is it's not, uh, no fun. It's I not thank God fun. though, but so, my, my support God system loves- during that time, like it was super helpful. I, I felt loved on and that makes a world of a difference. I will definitely say. It does. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I will say that's one thing that if you find yourself on this journey of fibroids or surgery or anything like that, mm-hmm. like have a team around you. Do not be too ashamed or do not be too um, concerned about letting people know. And I'm not saying you have to tell the world, but at right. least let a couple people know so that you do have that support because after in the healing process of it, because I know for a myomectomy, it's roughly about a six to eight or six to 10 week um healing process depending on the person and depending on what happened during your surgery mm-hmm. so it's a long time to have to kind of be on your own and taking care of yourself on your own so definitely have nobody family or friends <laughs> or somebody that you can trust that you can share about that because that ain't no joke at all okay so tell me a little bit about what the process was like for you post-surgery you know having to recover right. Right. Um, in a pandemic you know so we're literally still, you know, summer of 2020, you know, coming home, having to recover from there and kind of what the process was like for you to get. Yeah. So the recovery process, I'm really grateful because I stayed with mom and dad during that time. And food mom cooked for me during that time. Just the visits I got during that time. Um, (laughs) But the physical aspect of it, like I really just had to take it easy. Um, You know, surprisingly enough, I still had my cycle during that time. So that was kind of a uh, difficult aspect okay. of recovering and still having a cycle. I was hoping things would just yeah. pause for me, but it didn't. And so, you know, having to go through that while you're recovering, um, you know, having to go back for my post-op, you know, visit where everything cleared, everything looked good, you know. So it was just really me physically taking some downtime to make sure that I was okay, um, not doing too much physical activity and getting back to myself. I had my surgery in July, stayed in St. Pete through like the 1st of August, maybe. Um, And then back to Orlando and started trying to Mm -hmm. get back to my normal routine. So I would say not until September 1st is really where I felt the most like myself uh, that I could back out there. But it was a lot of just taking it slow, taking it easy and and allowing myself to heal and not, not being too hard on myself when I couldn't do too much. So, yeah. Yeah. No. I agree. I think that's the hardest part. Um, we had some of the same experiences in regards to, you know, our surgery. I got my cycle a week after, mm-hmm. which I think it was around the same thing for you, even though they told you that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> that's another thing. That part was like, um, but I agree. It is something that if you do find yourself having to have this surgery, um, that you do allow yourself to heal the way that you need to because if it, especially if it's something that you realize that you want to try to have a family yeah. that's not everybody's goal not everybody is looking uh-huh. for family some people just need relief to be quite honest um i wish i would have known that this was an option probably sooner in my life because i think i would have had less pain and less cycles that had pain um and for some people that is the case and there are some people who have fibroids that can live with them they don't need to have surgery they're able to maintain them they don't grow rapid rates they're not blocking anything that can keep them from being yeah. with children. We both know friends and family that have been able to have kids with their fibroids. So everybody's story is different, but I will say whatever it is that you need to do, especially if you have to have some sort of surgery, please give yourself the time that you need to be able to rest and recover because that is, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot. And it takes a while yeah. for you to start feeling like yourself again. Because again, you had yeah. your surgery in July, but it wasn't really until September that you started to really yeah. feel like yourself. So, so <laughs> now you've had your surgery. Um, now, at some point, though, and I know this is your story, when you went to get checked, and I don't know how long it was after that, there was yes, another so, discovered, right? ooh, I would say probably mid-2020 when I got checked, uh, there was another fibroid. Uh, very, very long. Sorry, 2020. 20- 2020 or 20 the following year 2021 um and so i did get checked and it wasn't large i i still have it thankfully it's not growing at a rapid pace Mm -hmm. um and so that was something that they did tell me would be a possibility 
is that if you come back, you may come back, yeah. you know, aggressively, maybe not. Just keep an eye on it. And so that's kind of what I did during that time. But um, but yeah, I still have it and uh, was able to get pregnant uh, with the five club. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'm day two. <laughs> And that's the thing. Everybody's story is different. So one, <laughs> class all around. Because I got under But I mean, truth be told, you know, you had fibroids, you had the surgery, you still have a fibroid, and also you were told that, you know, right. one of your fallopian tubes were damaged. So there were so many things that could yeah. have been a factor. And despite all of that, God was able to move and you are moving forward in pregnancy by the grace of God is going well. Um, and that's a blessing. Yeah. And everyone's story is different. For me, it was different. You know, I had my surgery, I got yeah. pregnant, I lost my yeah. baby, I found out I had another fibroid and the fibroid I had was in a prominent area. So I had to have another surgery to have that fibroid removed, even though that, that surgery wasn't as um as aggressive and invasive but everybody's story is different and i think that's a part of why we even wanted to come <laughs> together because here we are we're sisters we come from the same family um you know no. our parent our mom no. did not have fibroids to my knowledge right. our aunts did not have them even though we found out you know through our process and after the fact that we've had you know some right. of other family members cousins mainly who have had fibroids or have had some of these struggles but you can be in the same family you can have you know quote unquote the same story as somebody else but it'd be completely different based on that person's body based on what's going on with them um and you know moving forward from there so <laughs> now that we are pregnant even with a fibroid one just share with us what has your doctor said in regards to your fibroid that's still there now in your pregnancy does it have any effect does it even matter will they try to remove it when you, know, you go to deliver so this it's, it's a blessing you know i i remember just having to write, remind them like hey i do have a fibroid and so it's so small thank god and i feel like it's shrunk a little bit since i've gotten pregnant which i heard that as well um but you know they're not concerned we barely talk about it when i go for my visits they say everything is good. The baby looks healthy. So, you know, I always ask to monitor it just because of my experience. And I know what I've been through. I want to make sure that everything mm-hmm. is, is safe uh, for delivery. Um, but there hasn't been too much mention of it from their side. So. so yeah. <laughs> That's so good. And I mean, I know one thing that they tell you, I mean, unless God does something otherwise, is that once you've had right. myomectomy type of surgery, that typically your pregnancy, once you are pregnant, that you'll have to have a C-section in order for you to deliver. If that right. is the case, depending on what happens, will they, have they discussed whether they're going to remove the fibroid at that time? Or do they think they even need to do right. that? Or could it shrink right now, enough that they- Right now, they haven't said anything that? in regards to that. Um, I think it just depends on the size. I think it's so small right now. They're not too worried about it. But if it were to get bigger uh, by the time we're ready to deliver, then maybe they would. But it's just funny. They really have not play with it. We're not playing with it. <laughs> but no, I feel you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, again, I've heard stories of either them shrinking. Yeah. Or sometimes they calcify for people. Sometimes they degenerate. So, you know, which basically means that they break up and kind of dissipate right. and kind of, you know, leave the body. So, you know, prayerfully that will be, you know, the case, you know, right now, as, you know, a five <laughs> ball that he was, you know, able to <laughs> <Very funny. laughs> Oh my gosh. So, I mean, for you, it's been a really, really, um, it's been yeah. a very crazy journey, but at the same time, a really positive journey. Um, and I'm grateful that you have been willing to kind of, you know, share your story. Are there any things that, you know, before I probably see if there's any questions from people, but is there anything that you want to share a little bit more about either your journey, where you are now, things that you wish you knew, you know, beforehand, during the process, after the process? Yeah, you know, I think one just, I was nervous to to share when I first, you know, found out I had fibroids, I wasn't really sure just how deep it was, to be honest. And so I remember when I had my yeah. surgery in yeah. 2020, only a handful of friends and maybe two or three family members yeah. knew what was really going on. And I remember posting and people were like, 
you're recovering for what? You know, I'm in a wheelchair and like all right. these flowers around me. Right. And people were like, okay, so what happened to you? Right. And I really didn't know how to describe it. Yeah. I was a little ashamed, to be honest, because I was like, you know, something's going on with my reproductive system. And it just felt odd to know that something was wrong. And, and I felt this was unfair because, you know, I, I was waiting for marriage. And I was like, yeah. this doesn't make sense. And, you know, I was in my prime of meeting my now husband. So, I think that was just a part of it is that don't be ashamed. Just go get checked. <laughs> like, honestly, don't wait for yeah. somebody. You need to do it yourself. You need to advocate for yourself. Or if you're not comfortable, have somebody advocate for you. So I think that's one of the biggest lessons that I learned yeah. through this process is that you can't be ashamed. And God's always got my back. <laughs> like, 100%. And yes. uh, I was shocked when you said you had fibroids girl i was you were shocked so yeah. shocked when you said it because <laughs> you're like the picture per perfect picture of health to me you know you've always been so I I went listen don't do this alive okay you've always been, always been <laughs> very much in shape you've always taken good care of your body so when you came to me with that and the struggles that came after it my mind was blown and i said god has to be doing something you know, in the spiritual realm in regards to this, because this did not make sense. Yeah. But I think a part of it is to share our yeah. stories. Like I know tons of friends. Yeah. I can name I five know. friends, which I won't, <laughs> but you know, five friends right mm -hmm. now who have fibroids, mm -hmm. who are either going through it, who um, have had, you know, babies with fibroids or deciding if they're going to have surgery or not, who are monitoring the growth of their fibroids. So it's something that's super common, but I think I appreciate you allowing this platform for me to share because I would have never shared, honestly, and not for any selfish reasons. Well, I appreciate <laughs> But just because sharing. I was never yeah. comfortable, like putting myself out there. Yeah, yeah. Now there was, there was a question that came in. Someone asked, how do Ooh. you not lose hope in the midst of, of everything uh, that's um, going on? <laughs> Somebody cue the organ. Somebody, anybody got an organ? I can't. Um, I think it's a combination, of obviously, my faith. You know, I know a lot, a lot of people say that, but really God just helped me. And then my support system between you, I was falling yeah. in love at that time that I was going through my surgery. Yes, you are. So it's really fibroids, fertility, and yeah. Uh, yeah nice. so nice. i was i was falling in love during that time and i think for me that was a huge motivation like he didn't even know what he was getting into yeah. i met sean a week and a half before my surgery Listen. Listen. <laughs> that so let's let's just go let's stay in that realm a little bit so you we see it team, all clearly right. i know these things and again she she met you know they had just started dating. No, we weren't. Like, I don't even I know y'all were really dating. Like, one really day. had like a date or two. Two dates. Like, um, <laughs> one date prior to that. And she literally had to have, you know, surgery. But, you know, he and clearly bed. was interested in vesting. So he became cool with Mama Lodge. Uh, went to the rap. Cool with Mama Lodge. Uh, that's it. Um, but I... I will say I knew that my sister uh, <laughs> liked this here gentleman because I was there for her recovering. I took a week uh -huh. off work, came the day of her surgery, stayed that entire week to help take care of her. And he had to come to Tampa at that time. And he had reached out to my mom and he wanted to like bring her something and, you know, check in on her. Now, mind you, I mean, granted, love my sister. She's a beautiful woman. She was recovering from surgery. I was. She was as pale as could be. <laughs> she was as swollen as could be. Like, it's a whole thing. Like, after yeah. surgery, it's not pretty. It's just not. I was just as pale and, and, and swollen as she was after mine. But I remember her finding out that he wanted to come visit. And her really being like, first, she was just like, no, I can't have him see me like this. Then she was like, no, I really, really would love. I really, really, really would love for him to. Yeah. I was just like, girl. So here I am, while she's recovering, I'm trying to be like, well, should I put some powder on him? Yeah, well. Girl, no, because you don't want to lay down. Let me just put, just put some lip gloss on. Just keep it moving. But no. there's that part, which a lot of people, you know, here we are as sisters talking about it. But in our case, and I know that's not the case for everybody, but we are grown and in my case, old. Um, your case, still, still quite young. But um, but people forget, like, there are 
yeah. yeah. questions men that are attached yeah. to this and they're having to go through this with you. You know, for you, yeah. it was an early part of it. Um, so, you know, yeah. having to explain yeah. to him, I'm sure, was just an awkward thing. Him yeah. literally yeah. coming to see you in a moo moo, <laughs> you know, you were moo moo down to the socks, literally to the socks, you had no shoes on. And, <laughs> and then, you know, oh, my yeah. husband having to go through two surgeries. I mean, my surgery was right. December 30th of 2021. Mm -hmm. So we literally mm -hmm. spent yeah. New Year's Eve and New Year's in the hospital with you, eating hospital food. And I don't even know if I was awake when, you know, when the New Year rang mm -hmm. in. But yeah. that that is a big thing is that, you know, a lot of times we have these conversations, but there can be. And even before yeah. that, our dad and our brother, they were seeing us go through these pains. They were seeing us go through these, you know, different surgeries. They were having yeah. to deal with all these things from month to month. So. Fellas, for those of you, with you, and I have seen some guys that have popped in here, and I appreciate you guys hopping in because I know this right. may not uh, affect you directly, but your support is needed and it's warranted for the women that are in your life, whether it be a woman that is um, related right. to you or whether it be a really just close friend or whether it be someone that you love. Um, just realize it does, it does make a for difference sure. for sure. Yeah. Is there anything else that you would like to share? And is there anyone that has questions? If you have questions, you can either put them. There's a little question button, I believe. I can see it on my end. I don't know if you can see it on your end. Where you can put them in there, or you can put them in the comments, and I'll try to catch them. Is there anything else that you I'm want thinking to be the people? Just go get checked, and when you get checked, I'll see it for yourself. Uh, I have a lot of friends that told me after surgery that, like, you know, when I go for my annual. Or go for checkups they're not willing to do blood work they're not willing to do more ask for more know what your insurance will cover what it yeah. won't cover before you go to the appointment and just make right. sure you take those steps so that you can fully get the best health care possible because i mean at the end of the day if you're not advocating for yourself who will i have a beautiful mom nobody else advocated will. for me my whole life from a child to an adult but everybody doesn't have, you know, that that mm -hmm. support system. So I would say right. definitely take things seriously when they come. And don't be afraid. At the end of the day, like, I didn't know how my story was going to end up. And I thank God that it ended up the way that it did. Yeah. But, you know, one thing that God told me during my pregnancy is, are you going to have faith or fear? And um, either mm -hmm. you have are you gonna have faith or fear one or the other you can't have both it's so literally i yeah. sat down and i was like i'm gonna have faith if you allow me to be yeah. pregnant and i'm having a healthy pregnancy i'm gonna have faith that everything is gonna go well god's gonna allow it to go well so i think you know for anyone yeah. who's going through these situations yeah. have faith over fear find out the facts go get Correct. you know whatever workup you need there's people out there who want you well, and you want to make sure that you're taking yeah. care of yourself. Yeah. Work can wait. Anything can wait. Health cannot wait. Correct. So when they said, Correct. I have to go yeah. get surgery like ASAP, I was I was having a major event for my job coming up, and we figured it out. Afterwards, I told them, I was like, I'm not yeah. going to see y'all for a good six to eight weeks. And they work with me. People right. will work with you. So right. I think that's the thing. We get so caught up in the right yeah. now that we're we're afraid to do what we know we need to do mm -hmm. and i think that was it for me at first but afterwards i was like i'm so glad i took the step and did this because it was life-changing for sure that's a whole word one getting one advocating for yourself two definitely getting you know second and third opinions and i would say right. just realize that there's no shame in any of it um i think for a lot of people, you know, especially women, yeah. you're taught that this is what your body's supposed to do. You're supposed to be able to have kids. You're supposed to be able to do this. You know, your body should be able to handle this. Or even on the workplace, I now looking back because the struggle wasn't just right. college in terms yep. of pain. As an adult, as a professional, I remember I was a leasing agent working and I had my cycle so bad one day and I went to work anyways. I was heavily bleeding. I was vomiting, having to go in and out of the bathroom. And my boss literally came to me and said, you need to go home. You cannot like your job requires you to go upstairs to show people apartments. You cannot do that right now. Like you need to go home. And she wasn't even saying it being me. <laughs> and I'm telling her like, no, nope. I, I got it. I can do it. Just, if I, just let me vomit one more. I had to, when I left and went home, on the uh -huh. drive home, I had to stop and vomit. 
And I think that's the thing that I wish there was more to do because I think people have to understand. And that's why I want to amplify women's voices on this more is if you deal with these issues, it's in your everyday life at least once a month. So you're having to go to work in this pain. People are not always so understanding. You're having to work around it. You're having to figure it out. Um, I was taking so yeah. many pain pills, like which who knows how. I mean, nope. a leaf. It was nothing. Nothing. To pop for. Nothing. nothing. <laughs> it was like candy. To <laughs> um, how safe that is? The world may never know. But that's yep. what I had to do sometimes to get through the day. Um, and I think that's the thing is just. There's no, just remember, there's no shame in that. Ask what you need to ask. Like Marika said, advocate for yourself. Find out what your insurance will cover. If there's something you have to save right. for, save up for it. If you have to ask to do something that they're telling you you can't do. In my case, I wouldn't have even known that I had fibroids. Yeah. If it wasn't that I was struggling to have a child. And when I realized that I wasn't able to have a child, then I was then recommended to a reproductive specialist. And then... You know, my doctor was like, oh, well, I would have done an ultrasound, but since they're going to do one, we'll let them do one. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't for me trying to have a child, I yep. probably wouldn't have known that I would have had fibroids. Or I probably would have figured it out later on down the line because there was no reason for me to figure it out. Or at that time, I had already sure. told myself based on what they told me that there was nothing wrong. And the minute that I talked to the reproductive specialist, he hadn't even seen anything yet. Just based off of what I was telling him, he was like, oh, you sound like you have endometriosis <laughs> and fibroids. I said, excuse me, what? sir. Wow. <laughs> Excuse me? How, how do you go from one thing to all the things? Oh, and then I have right. to have surgery and all the things are crazy. So, I mean, I think for me, that would be the main thing is just yeah. keep on asking until somebody believes you. Keep on going to someone until someone takes you seriously. Um, don't be ashamed yeah. of what your body can or can't do. Don't let someone tell you you're less of a woman because of what your body can or can't do. And this is not just for women who want to have children. No. Because there's some women who literally no, don't want yeah. to have children, and that's okay. It's their choice whether they want to, you know, have a child or not. Children are nothing light. They're huge responsibility, and you know, you're basically in charge of helping someone grow and live this life. So it's not something to take lightly. And some people want to live their lives in a different way, but it's still one life mm-hmm. that you have, which means your health is still important. So you still need to make sure you take care of your health. And I would say to any of the young women who may be watching this, and when I say young women, I'm thinking like, you know, yeah. fresh out of high school, school to college, you know, <laughs> early 20s, you know, almost 30 ages where, you know, you may not be thinking about children like that. You're more focused on your career or, you know, school or life. Right. Please don't neglect your health, though. One of the things that I can speak on behalf of me and my sister is, and I can say this for myself, because I was waiting until marriage, I didn't really think about kids like that because okay. I was like, I ain't doing nothing to have them right now anyway, so it's not a worry about a worry to me. And then two, even when I got married, me and my husband wanted to have time to just enjoy our marriage. So again, I still wasn't thinking about kids in that way. Um, and on one hand, I had all the faith in the world, so I just assumed like when it is time for me to have kids, yep. kids will come. I'll be good. I had the road no lock. idea, no clue what uh, the road that was going to be ahead of me. And then once I did realize, like you know, shoot, this is happening. A part of me felt a little slighted, like, oh, my gosh, uh-huh. did I waste time? Should I have done certain things sooner? Now, we all know it's, it's God's time. Mm-hmm. We, don't, we don't have control over those things. Like, God is going to do what God is going to do. I can't go back into time and, you know, redo something that I didn't know. But for those of you that are hearing this and seeing this and you had never heard about fibroids before, or endometriosis before, or any of those things, please do what you need to do to have those checks and have those things checked out now so that if children is something that you do want to do and have in the future, if there's something that could be a hindrance to you, you can find out about it now. And it's not something you have to worry about. Yeah. You're actually trying to have them that you are concerned about. Because that's College really D. Good. That's really good advice. I think we would have, yeah. have never, I would have never thought, never Girl. really years thought that Girl. that would be never. the And our, our family yep. history, we come from a family where our grandmother, she was technically conceived 12 yep. kids. She had nine out of the 12. Um, everybody in our family, including our parents. I mean, my mom has three kids. Yep. My aunts all had three kids. Some of them yeah. had them into their early 40s. So there was nothing in our family history that made us think anything different. Like, we knew, right. like, okay, this is what our family <laughs> does. We're yeah. married. We have kids. Like, it, it's the same thing that's going to happen for us. And 
you know, we're realizing, yes. especially the younger generation, our cousins especially, realizing that some of them have been affected in a crazier way than we realize. So you can't assume based on your family history, you can't assume, I mean, again, we're sisters having similar but also different experiences. You really just need to know for yourself, ask for those out ultrasounds, you know, an annual check is great. Yes. I went religiously to my annual checks. Guess what they didn't find? Crazy. Thyroids. Guess yes. what they didn't find? Endometriosis. Why? Because they're not going to figure out during a regular annual check that you have those things. You have to have an ultrasound. They have to look deeper. So, you know, I would just say, please, please, please advocate for yourself. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Um, and, you know, be willing to share your story with those. Even if it's not on a platform, be willing to share with those around you because I've had people who have discovered that they have had fibroids because I have shared my story and some of the things that they saw that were similar in what I've shared. They're like, well, let me get checked and right. find out, oh, my gosh, this is affecting me, too. So sometimes just caring about those that you have around you can make a difference. Oh, but wow. girl, it is almost like <laughs> we've been on here since six, so I will not belabor this any longer. If there isn't any questions from anyone, and thank you, um, yes. my friend Monica, who did give a question. Um, if there aren't any questions from anyone, um, we will go ahead and, you know, close this out. But um, again, Meeks, so well, Marika, <laughs> let me stop. Meeks is what I call her. Just right here, but Marika, Marika, this is Stuart. Um, thank you for just being brave enough to share your story and to, you know, share just how God took you from, you know, pain and fibroids to now no. you know, waiting on your baby boy to arrive sometime in the summertime. Um, that's a blessing. Yeah. I am still on my journey and will continue to share my journey, journey like I have been on Instagram. I just yeah. am believing that God is going to allow my sister to have another cousin, yeah. lose one Amen. Cousin, another cousin um, that they can play <laughs> with here on earth um, together. So I'm looking forward to that. And again, this will be something that I do monthly. I'm going to be sharing stories um, and maybe it'll be more than once a month, depending on how many people I, I literally have at least like five yeah. or six stories that are lined up the next couple months different people that I've talked to that want to share their different stories. The next one will be my hysterectomy story. And a lot of times when people think of hysterectomies, they think right. of older women who are, you know, having this, but it's something that can affect young women as well. And I have an amazing young woman who's going to be brave enough to share her story with us next month. It'll be March 26th. So be sure that you, um, you know, tune in for that. Um, but thank you guys so much for being on here. Marika, yeah. thanks again. I hope you feel a better friend. I miss you. Me and you. I miss you too. Um, but again, thank you all so much for tuning in. And hopefully those that missed it, you'll watch it on Instagram. I'm going to make sure I post it right away. And I'll also be sure that I share a version of it on YouTube. So it'll be there. If this is information that will help a friend, that will help a family member, that will you know be educational for anyone, please be sure that you share it with them thank as well. But and thank you to all our friends. <laughs> I see you guys. Um, Patrick, Erica, Monica, and Sanika, and there's so many other people. I don't want to go calling out names because then people will be upset. But you all know who you are. I've seen you all hop in here. Family members, cousins. Um, thank you all for caring enough to hop on here and to yes. watch as we go live. Love, but love y'all. You too. Me. I love you, friend. Um, and until mm -hmm. next month, uh, I'll see you next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Bye y'all. Take care. Well, for all of you that stayed and watched the entire interview, thank you all so much as I know that it was a lot of great information, but it was also a lot of your time. And I know that I do not take people spending their time watching anything that I put together or produce lightly. So thank you so much for being willing to listen to my beautiful sister Marika share her five word story and for us to share and get into more in depth about our stories. Now, if this is something that really, really resonates with you and you believe that you want to share your story on an Instagram Live one of these days with me, I would love that and I would welcome it. I have a website now called ShaniSpeaksNow.com. On my website, I share more deeply about my story, but I also have an email address and it's hi Shani at ShaniSpeaksNow.com. And that is where I would love for you to send your request or if you follow me on social media, especially on Instagram, at ShaniSpeaksNow, just send me a DM. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your story and maybe you can be featured on one of my fill in the blank stories, filling in the blank with your reproductive health, or your you know, pregnancy journey, whatever it is, your story that kind of fits 
um, this series topic because I really want to amplify the voices of women and families and those who may be dealing with some of these things so that not only can you share and kind of get it out, but also you can have a platform where you can feel heard. I am very, very excited about this series and look forward to sharing it right here on my YouTube as I always do. Well, look, it don't matter what I do, it don't matter what happens, we always gonna end with the motto, you hear me? <laughs> so in true Shani Speaks Now fashion, always keep the faith and let the Lord fight your battles. Until next time, take care. Love y'all. Peace. Thanks for watching, Faith Fam. Be sure to subscribe, share, and like this episode. And I'll see you back on my channel soon.